Hello, everyone. Chris Cuthbert here. And in today's episode, I speak with Susan and we cover things like driving traffic to your own Amazon listings, building your own niche and authority style websites to drive traffic to your own listings. We talk about Amazon SEO, Google SEO, and a whole lot of other topics that we don't normally cover on this show. So I think you're going to enjoy this episode. Stay tuned and tell us what you think. Let's start the show. Hello, everyone. Chris Guthrie here, host of SellerCast. And today I have Susan on the show as well. Susan, welcome. Hello, Chris. Great to talk to you. Glad to be here. Yeah, so I'm so excited to talk to you. I've seen you on Facebook and we've talked a little bit back and forth and uh, we've finally scheduled this down and we've got a time to chat. So I'm so excited to, to talk to you. So uh, let's get into the some of the starting questions. So how long have you been selling on Amazon for? My first product went live July 19th, 2000. 14. I remember because I was sitting at ASM3 and was very excited uh, to make my first sale while I was uh, while I was sitting there. Oh, that's great. So you had previously gotten your units sent out, and then you were at the out at the event conference type thing, and then you you got your first sale. Yes, yes. That's great. So then, what were you doing uh, before you started selling on Amazon? Anything related to e-commerce that kind of led you to get into this path? Uh, I had been uh, doing SEO from. Boy, about 2003, 2014, I, uh, I started with uh, general search engine optimization. I did uh, pages to earn money with AdSense. I did some affiliate. I did some client work. So I was pretty uh, conversant with ranking on Google. And uh, as you know, 2012, 2013 were pretty rocky years for Google. Uh, so I decided I needed to diversify my income stream. So I still do work on Google SEO, but uh, I also do Amazon SEO and use that for myself. Yeah, yeah. So we have similar backgrounds because that's how I kind of got started as well was building and ranking websites and AdSense, Amazon, affiliate stuff, et cetera. Uh, so then, so basically once those, the Panda and Penguin algorithm updates occur with with Google, you're like, okay, let's let's look at something else. And that's what led you to, to e-commerce and selling on Amazon. Actually, it was, it was after that with Panda, my, my, all my sites ranked, uh, improved in rank. Panda was, oh, okay. <laughs> Panda was a good thing for me and Penguin didn't affect me at all. Uh, I got, uh, I got caught in a, a very, very minor algorithm change to anybody else, but it was material to me because it took away 90% of my income. The, uh, click fraud cloud cover, uh, switch that happened in February, March, 2014 that oh, okay. I eventually recovered from, but, uh, it was, it was pretty rocky at the time. Yeah. So anytime a massive income shakeup occurs and it makes you think, okay, what maybe I need to diversify or, or go into something else. So then, so that's how you kind of get into that. And I'm curious. And so because you had this background with, uh, Google SEO, maybe we can talk a little bit about Amazon SEO as well, but, did, were you using, this is the one thing I was curious about, were you using the existing sites that you had, had built to help drive traffic to any of your Amazon listings when you first got started? Or was it all just kind of pure organic Amazon traffic to help you got your, your first few sales? Um, I did, and, and I can talk about that because I did use a large PBN network that I had to help me rank my Amazon listing on Google. Um, but that's not how I got my Amazon listing ranked. And uh I thought it helped while I was doing it, but when that PBA network crashed and I lost it, my Amazon listing for that first product went from number 11 to number 13. So the Google work that I had done and getting it uh, ranked, I was number two on Google for a very major, very competitive term. Uh, and when that went away to, to nothing, it didn't impact my sales at all and uh, didn't materially affect my Amazon rank. Interesting. So I would, I do want to actually dive in a little bit about Google SEO and whether you should or shouldn't rank your, your listings on Google. But just to clarify for people that might not be familiar, PBN is just short for private blog network. And, and Susan, you can probably explain it as well, but basically uh, you're, there's a bunch of different blogs in various niches. And then you have those links pointed back at some destination, such as your Amazon listing. And then that can help improve, improve rankings, but then Amazon or Google rather made an algorithm update that uh, targeted those tactics specifically a little while back. It targeted the specific network I was involved with. It wasn't one I owned. It was one I participated in with other people. We had 500 blogs. Uh, for example, if, uh, you know, if, assume I had, I was ranking for dog food, assume it was a, a dog food thing, then the blogs would all be related to dog food reviews and things. And uh, I just had a very, very simple, uh, what I did for people that, that do want to try this, uh, was I didn't use any anchor text. In other words, I didn't link the word dog food back to my listing. I just used uh, a canonical URL that had the appropriate keywords in it. 
and uh, did a, a plain read more at uh, link. And there were about uh, about 500 links. And it got okay, to so number two for a term that wasn't dog food, but was about as competitive as dog food. Um, didn't do a lot for sales. My sales were coming organically through Amazon. Uh, it did, uh, I do get sales from a YouTube video that I have ranked on the page, on page one of Google using those same techniques. Uh, but what I would do if I was doing it again and was going to focus on Google uh, with a PBN is that I would focus for the keyword plus the term reviews because Google searchers are, aren't are buyers yet. They're doing research on a product. Amazon searchers are buyers. So when you are ranking on Google, basically you want to rank for uh, research terms, like what is the best such and such, or Himes Dog Food versus Purina, or reviews and, and that type that type thing. Uh, just the same way you're building an affiliate site. Yeah, that's great. I mean, that's like the entirety of what I used to do when I was building and ranking websites targeting Amazon's affiliate program. It was all just product review web type websites because I found that same thing that, hey, this traffic from Google in general, they might be looking for anything. They might be buyers, but they might not be. And usually they aren't. But when they're searching for reviews, then they definitely are buyers. And then that was really um, eye opening for me back in like 2000 eight or nine or something like that. It was so long ago, I forget now, but uh, yes, that's great. So then, so are you still using PBNs to help rank in Google or you me just mentioned that the YouTube has helped you with some sales, but your Google ranking hadn't. So is that something you think people should still focus on? I think when you get to a certain point, yes. Uh, but first, what you need to do is rank on Amazon and everybody thinks yeah. people coming from SEO think, oh, if I rank on Google, I'll rank on Amazon. But ranking on Amazon is different than ranking on Google. Um, you know, it, it's similar, in fact, that they're both looking for a good user experience, uh, but the type of user experience that they're looking for when they're ranking on Amazon is different than the user experience on Google. Uh, so what I would advise and what I do advise my, my clients, because I do work with people helping them increase their Amazon sales, uh, is to focus on Amazon first. Uh, and then after Amazon, uh, solely on Amazon, look at paid traffic from other sources. Uh, I do caution them if they do want to use uh, a PBN that they make sure they use an intermediary link, not because it's going to cause a problem on Amazon, meaning that you're going to link to another website uh, in the middle. But uh, and what you want to be able to do is eventually, I think the goal of every Amazon seller should be to build a robust off Amazon business. And if you link directly mm -hmm. to your Amazon listing, uh, then all those links you built just go to the listing. But if you link to an intermediary page, you can then redirect that intermediary page from your Amazon listing to your own site and get the benefit of all that link building work you've done where it really counts, where you're going to make more of the money for yourself. That's great. So right now, though, when you are doing those intermediary pages, they're just pointing to Amazon, but just you want to be able to have the ability to go back and point them somewhere else, basically. Uh, it depends on the product. I I, mm. I have some uh, some products that are at the level of maturity where I am doing significant off, off Amazon sales. Uh, but for product, for someone who is just starting out and building their Amazon business, uh, I would say that, you know, point the links if you're going to do that to Amazon, but I wouldn't recommend doing it. But some but okay. some people feel very passionately about it. And I'm going to say if you do use an intermediate intermediary page. Yeah. And so then the reason for the and it depends on the product, as you mentioned. But the reason for that is so that you can try and pre-sell them before they actually get to Amazon so that the traffic you do send is more highly qualified, and more likely to convert. Right. That's the, the idea behind that. No, that's different. That's what I'm doing. That's when just when I'm doing funnels. The reason okay. that I use the intermediary page when I'm doing PBNs, because all PBNs are sell are sending is link juice. Uh, yeah. They're really not sending buyers. Uh, so I use the oh, intermediary okay. page so that I don't waste the links. Gotcha. Okay, and that's so, great. Because you can then change it. If you have 500 links going to the intermediary page that goes to your listing, you just then change the intermediary page from pointing to your listing. You can actually do it as a 301 redirect to your, uh, to your hosted e-commerce site later on. But what you had said about qualifying them before they get to uh, your Amazon listing uh, is good, but it's not really sending qualified traffic to your Amazon listing isn't really important. Uh, what's important is that they're serious 
buyers who are looking to buy, not necessarily your product. Amazon rewards you in the in the algorithm uh, as long as they buy on Amazon. Whether or not when you go from outside, you get all those additional uh, product choices. Uh, Amazon will reward you even if they're not buying your uh, your product. They'll reward you for buying somebody else's somebody else's. If, if you drive traffic that buys, and that's one of the ways Amazon is different. Amazon wants to make the most money, and if by you know having your page out there, um, you know your page drives traffic to something else, they're going to show they're going to show their own ads for your page in more different places because they know you're an attractive product, which is going to bring people to Amazon. Interesting. I think you're the first person that's said that rather than just the traffic needing to convert on that specific product, it can matter if it's just converts in general on Amazon. I probably, I um, probably shouldn't have said that in public. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's there after- a lot of us talk about it. Probably, probably shouldn't have said it in public, but you no, know, it's, <laughs> you know, think about what Amazon wants. What Amazon yeah. wants is to make money and they want to make money, uh, you know, from your product and they want to make money from, uh, you know, from other products. So if you have an attractive product that when someone follows, you know, a link into Amazon from your product, they spend money on Amazon, you're going to be rewarded. And it may not be rewarded with a rank boost on your product. It may be rewarded that, uh, you know, when Amazon sellers looking for a specific product, uh, you know, are retargeted, Amazon will show them your product in those ads on Facebook uh, or all over the internet because they know your product drags people in to buy. Oh, that's very interesting. Well, it's I. you said that you probably shouldn't have said it in public, but I'm going to go ahead and do the uh, no takesy backsies. No, nope, I got it. No, I got it. I got it. I was teasing about that when you said I was the, you know, I was the first one to say it. But the, you know, the issue is you want to think about, it's an example of think about what Amazon wants and Amazon yeah. wants to sell things. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's the general advice that I give to people too, is just if you're thinking about what Amazon wants in general, they want to make money, then frame that around how you should think about what you're doing in your business. And that can help you answer a lot of questions that you might not know what to do. Um, that's great. So then uh, another thing I'm curious about, so you, you work with clients, but you also work on your own Amazon business. What do you primarily focus on these days? Since you mentioned before that part of your goal is to make sure you're not on Amazon, and it sounds like you have some of your business not on Amazon as it is. Are you primarily focused on you know, picking and, and and launching new products? Are you working on building out websites since you have that background where you can build up content sites and then you're driving traffic and, and selling your products on your own websites? Or what are you focused on these days? And I'm curious how that split is, is split up. I'm primary, primarily focused on learning how to live without sleep <laughs> because I am, you know, it really depends on, on where I am. I'm heading into two weeks of trade shows, um, So for the next month and a half, my number one focus is going to be new products. Mm -hmm. Um, My number one focus for the past uh, month has probably been uh, building up affiliate websites for my products uh, and, you know, to, to help build up the off Amazon presence. But I'm moving now into, you know, the identifying and selecting new products, um, my my listing process and launch process is fairly systemized so that, you know, after I have gotten the new products, I'll be doing firefighting in terms of stuff, getting stuff and stuff in customs. Boy, I've had fun with that. Um, you know, and when you're when you're dealing with products, you have all that that type stuff. But you know, I'm, yeah. I'm heading into uh, product sourcing because really I need to have all of that lined up by the beginning of June to be ready for the holiday season next year. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. So then I want to touch on the affiliates site thing that you mentioned. So one, are you using a separate Amazon account or just the same Amazon account that's tied to your seller account for your Amazon associates? I might have said I might have said that interestingly. No, I understand what you I understand what you're saying, and I'm trying to determine how to answer that because of course it is against Amazon terms of service to have multiple seller accounts. Um so, oh, so I, I meant that, that there is no there is no issue at all with uh, Amazon is okay with you using uh, the same email address for an affiliate uh, affiliate account that sells products on a seller account with that email address. That's what I was trying to get at. So yes. I wasn't mentioning you are, that. You are certainly you are certainly allowed to do that. Uh, there is 
no penalty. So if you do a great job at it, I mean, you can get back most of that referral commission uh, into your own yeah. pockets if you you know get it up to 10% or something. But what's more important is uh, not, and I don't focus on it for getting affiliate income, but it's a really great way to track where your traffic is coming from because you can do up mm -hmm. to 500 different affiliate codes on your, uh, on your account. So if you have, you know, a Facebook funnel and the Facebook funnel always goes to a page on a certain affiliate site for a certain product, uh, you can then track and see the, the clicks that come in through that site because you don't get conversion data from Amazon, but you can track your, your funnel data in terms of, you know, how many people saw it and then how many people click through on the funnel. And then you can look through your affiliate, um, reports and see how many people bought with that affiliate ID. So by using uh, your affiliate code, you can uh, get really good information about uh, how your off Amazon campaigns are working. Yeah, that's great. And I know too, uh, and for those that aren't familiar with the associates program, it's, it's volume based. It starts at, I believe 4% and then goes up to, I think it's eight and a half percent. It's all based on the volume. I think you have to send over three, sell like over 3000 items to get to that top tier. And then certain categories are, are fixed at certain rates, just like how on Seller Central, there are different rates that you might be paying in fees. Some categories that you refer on Amazon Associates program are gonna have different. And then on that, to your point about the 500 tracking IDs, you can actually request uh, more once you hit that limit, because um, that was something I ran into on the affiliate side. So then let's talk about uh, a little bit more about those affiliate sites. So what are you primarily, are you trying to build really specific narrow niche sites? Or are you trying to build an authority, much larger site with a lot of content and people that you've hired to write really great stuff? Or are you going for smaller things? Both. I have uh, affiliate sites for each product that I'm primarily using for tracking information. Uh, I mm -hmm. actually have multiple affiliate sites for each product because I want a different affiliate site for, uh, you know, for uh, each uh, channel that I'm sending. And then I'm also building larger affiliate sites that actually I'm using for general affiliate income in my niche with more than my products. Yeah, that's great. And so then you also make money from additional sources on those sites and beyond just the Amazon affiliate site. Of course. That's great. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's the thing is that a lot of times, especially people that are listening that might be newer sellers, they get really narrowly focused on, okay, I'm selling on Amazon so I can make money on, on just Amazon. They don't think about the opportunities of driving revenue from perhaps digital products or other types of revenue streams if they're trying to build up the content type sites like you have. Yes. So I think it's a good eye opener. So then uh, let's talk a little bit about, and I so probably already know the answer to this question, but let's talk about your actual sales on Amazon. So are you able to share where you're at with sales or where you're doing with some of your products? Um, well, I'll just say I'm doing pretty well. Um, I don't like to uh, to share numbers because there is a, there's a lot of junk out there about the numbers. I think the easiest earnings report in the world to fake is an Amazon earnings report. Uh, because you can uh, inflate sales price with giveaways. Um, people do fake buys. People do all kinds of things. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff out there in terms of numbers that's meaningless. Uh, particularly, there are people, uh, when you wholesale, you may have a 10% profit, mar profit margin, so it may look like mm -hmm. your numbers are really great. Um, so I generally don't talk about uh, numbers other than to say I'm doing I'm doing pretty well. You know, I have, yeah. uh, I have uh, you know, a lot of products. <laughs> And uh, they're doing uh, they're doing well, and I'm adding more. So that's great. No, I like that, and I, I like that answer too. Again, because you know people might not be aware of that, but yeah, I see the I see the income reports people post in the Facebook groups. I did a million dollars last month, and it's like, okay, well, how much of that did you keep? <laughs> and, and I think a lot of it is intimidating because people will sit there and see that and say, oh my god, I can't do that. I can't mm -hmm. do that. And they may not realize that somebody that's posting that they hit ten thousand dollars could actually have more in their pocket than somebody who's posting that they hit fifty or seventy five thousand dollars this month. So, um, I to people out there that are listening that are that are newbies, it's definitely possible. And don't allow yourself to be intimidated by numbers, but do allow yourself to be inspired because it is definitely possible, um, you know, to sell six figures a month, seven figures a month in this. Uh, certain times of the year in this process. Yeah, I love this. So then what are your, you know, there's several different things I wanted to ask you actually, uh, but we'll save this other one that I had in mind for the end. Uh, I wanted to ask about 
because you've been launching so many different products and that's even something you're focused on today in terms of ranking, you know, building up sites, ranking those sites, driving traffic from those sites as well. Um, what are you doing when it comes to finding a product that isn't really doing well? Like you've got, you've launched it. You said you had a system for launching it. Maybe we can talk a little bit about your system as well, but what are you deciding? When do you make that decision? Okay, this product just isn't going to work. And sometimes they don't work and let me just do a different one. I haven't killed one yet. Basically, because when I do products, they all link with each other. Mm -hmm. So uh, I do a lot of cross promoting in in a certain brand. I have multiple brands, but in in a brand, I do cross promoting. So, for example, the first uh, product that I launched, which was in a highly competitive category, and I got to page one. And as soon as I got there, I mean, it was war with, you know, Mm -hmm. people doing negative review campaigns and So then I'd wind up doing more giveaways and then there'd be negative review campaigns and it just got really expensive. So what I decided to do after about six months was just stop promoting it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it stayed there and it was, I don't know, mid page to top of page three. So right before Christmas, then I did a, uh, a, you know, a new program uh, promoting it and, uh, got it back up again. So I did sales in the holidays. Um, the attack started again and now I've stopped uh, promoting it again. And I'm just going to sort of let it sit mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. It's, it's just, once you get up to that top level, then you, you, everyone comes out on the attack, at least in super competitive areas, which is I'm assuming where you're at uh, for that specific product at least. So that's sort of, it's, it's, you know, and it can be tough with the super competitive products and they can make money, but you need to be prepared for evil things. <laughs> yeah. Well, what are some of the, well, we can maybe talk about, you know, I, I'm even thinking too, that as we talk that we could probably do a, a two-parter episode. So maybe what we'll do is we'll focus on some other topics and then maybe we can, you can come back again and, and we can dive into some others. But I, I wanted to talk a little bit about your, your launch strategy then, since you have a system that you have for that, you have a system for picking your products. Um, do you want to briefly talk about those? Um, which, which would you prefer me to talk about first? Let's go with the, the picking and then we'll go to the launching after that. Okay. My picking is not systemized. Okay. Then let's go with the launching instead. Since we, a lot of people talk about, we've had people talk about how they select products before. Let's, let's focus on that instead. Well, the first thing I do, uh, with the launch is I get, uh, reviews, um, which I will, uh, I do by building my own email list. Mm-hmm. And I, uh, I get, I get a core number of reviews before I do a launch. And I call that, that's my, my soft, my soft launch. And I do it through getting reviews. Then I do a hard launch where I do giveaways. I determine how many I'm going to need to rank. And I do a giveaway of, of a certain number a day until I get to, uh, get to where I am. And then organic sales start coming in and I monitor it. And we'll still do giveaways probably for the first two or three months. Um, depending on it, the giveaways are anywhere from five to 30 a day, depending on how competitive the product is. Uh, I've been able to uh, to make that easier by finding Facebook groups that are analogous to a product. For example, if it was a dog food group, if I found pet lovers, uh, I'd go to pet lovers or animal shelters and offer, you know, a coupon for, you know, 90, 50 to 90 percent off to their customers, uh, mm-hmm. which is generally better than the people that do hardcore Amazon reviews who are looking for it for free. And that that can be a great source of initial traffic. You know, if you, for example, if you have a pet product and you go to an animal rescue page and say, hey, we'll give you five dollars for every one of these your people buy and also give them a five or ten dollar coupon. Uh, you're going to get some interested customers first. So it's not rocket science, but that's basically what uh, what I do. Yeah, that's great. So how do you handle the actual distribution of those codes? Do you have some sort of a sign up for our email list first and then you'll get the code or do you show them the Amazon yes. uh, listing URL when you do that? No, I, I, actually, well, I actually run a review service that provides people with email lists so that I uh, I collect it through my service, collect the names. If they're not already on my list, depending on the product, they probably are. And then I, uh, you know, I just send them out the code directly. Okay, cool. So you've got multiple different lists kind of segmented out by different interests. Yes. And then you can use those for your own products and for clients and stuff as well. Okay. So then another question I had was just what are your general goals for this business? I mean, it sounds like after the 2012, 2013 Google updates, it was just, okay, let me find something else that's more stable. Uh, 
and you've done well with Amazon now and also off Amazon, what are you tri- primarily thinking about in terms of your long-term goals for this, for your e-commerce business? Oh, I want to continue to build the brand. I'm not looking to sell and churn. Uh, I'm in this because I enjoy doing it. Um, doesn't mean that I won't sell and churn at some point, but right now I just want to continue building the brand and I'd like to get, uh, you know, I'm in two stores off Amazon now. I'd love to see the brand in, uh, in more stores. Oh, great. So you're selling in, in, physical brick and mortar stores or are you referring to online stores that you've set up like Shopify? I'm in two physical brick and mortar stores. They're not major chain stores. They're local stores um, that, you know, specialize in the the niche that I sell in. Oh, okay. And so how did you actually do that? Was it just as simple as contact them and saying, Hey, I have this product and it does well on Amazon. Right. One was a, uh, one also has a Facebook group. They're both local. And that I would give, uh, you know, free coupons to her customers every time I launched. And I'd get, send her the product every time I launched. And eventually uh, she found a product that she fell in love with. And then after falling in love with one, my entire line was in her store. Uh, the other one, I just brought uh, a, a customer that had found me through that other place said, hey, I shop here. And I was telling the owner about you and think you're great. You should go down there. And so I brought her down a box of my stuff and uh, she's now selling it as well. So it's been it's been very direct. It's not the uh, you know the systems of finding buyers and approaching them, uh, but that's because I have a niche specific product, and there are stores that specialize in that you know that niche. So you can uh, you can go down and capitalize it. For example, you can go to you know if there are local pet stores in your area, or if you're selling coffee and tea supplies, you know you can go into the local niche coffee shops and say, hey, I have these really cool things. Would you like to sell them? That's great. So you, so in those cases, you had a little bit of a warm introduction in a sense. You already worked with the Facebook group, and then you also had someone say this that you're great, and that helped with those. Well, the Facebook group, I had to do the warm introduction to by saying, "Hey, can I give away this stuff to your your people?" Gotcha. And it took me about you know nine months of of doing that, and then she was like, "Hey, okay, let's uh, you know let's let's go further with this." And then the other one was a you know a warm introduction, which you can actually. Uh, you can see a warm introduction if you're looking for that, because I'm sure if you're talking particularly about local stores that you know people that go in there and they can just, uh, you know, say, hey, do you carry such and such a product? Yeah, yeah, that's great. So then are you currently focusing on trying to get more stores or you just want to continue reaching out to those Facebook groups or Facebook pages and then building those relationships that way before even bothering going to the brick uh, and mortar stores? I'm I'm happy right now with the two I have. I would eventually like to be in in more but I'm focusing more on building the brand because I don't think I'm big enough yet for the bigger stores to be really interested in me. That makes sense. And this way too, they can kind of serve as proof of concept as well. So you can say on Amazon and also in brick and mortar in these two locations type of thing. Correct. Okay. So then what uh, beyond, uh, what was I going to ask you? Yeah. I wanted to ask you too about the mistakes that you've made along the way. When you've been selling on Amazon after coming from, from Google, what are some of the things that you found? Was it just poor product picks sometime? I know you mentioned you haven't had to kill anyone off, but um, I wanted to know what, what problems you've had along the way and, and how you resolve those. That's a good question because I generally don't think of things as problems. I think of them as learning opportunities. Uh, for example, in my first season, so in the fall of 2004, I had just about sold out my initial order quantity and I'd placed another order, you know, so I'd be ready for Christmas. And I had 284 units left in the middle of October. And I had a customer that had a problem. And so I fixed it the way I usually do by sending the customer a coupon code. It was one customer, one code, um, did not reserve the inventory. You can see where this is going. (laughs) Okay. Because I just didn't think, you know, it was one customer. And this was before we had the one-time use codes that can go for this. So, uh, I was on the phone with my VA and I went and I checked something and this was 40 minutes later and my inventory was gone. I had nothing left. So I immediately called seller central and uh, it was a pain in the neck, but we were able, I tried to cancel them all. We were able to cancel half of them. And what I did, because again, I was concerned about my seller metrics being relatively new is that for the half that I canceled, I sent uh, an email to saying, you know, I'm really sorry. This is what happened. It was a private code that went public. And uh, I'd like to honor this for you because I know you weren't, you know, you were innocent and you really expected that you would get this, uh, you know, product for free. 
So uh, what I'd like to do is when it comes back in stock, which will be, you know, approximately the second week in November, I'd like to send you a code at that time. Please respond back to me if you are interested. I had of the, uh, you know, 140 emails that I sent out, three people got back to me being really nasty, you know, about what, what, you know, you can't, can't do that to me. And then about 80% of them said, um, yeah, they thought it was great and wrote back absolutely wonderful things. Uh, some of them even posted online in the coupon sites where people were then complaining, it's all sold out. How come we can't get it? You know, about, hey, this is what happened and the seller is so great. In the end, about 65 of those people did take me up on it. And that was my, my relaunch when it came back. So I was able to stretch the product sales out with that 140 that I could get back. So I never really went, went out of stock. Oh, I had wow. to raise the price to twice what it was selling at, which did hit my rank a little bit. Um, but I was still able to be on uh, page one. And then when they came back in, I was able to use this very, very warm list of people who already thought I was an absolutely terrific person um, to use for a burst of sales velocity at that time. So, uh, you know, while I made a mistake in terms of not reserving my inventory, I was able to turn it around into a really good opportunity. And I've since talked to and worked with people that have had that as a problem. Uh, some of them don't catch it enough time to cancel it. If that does happen to you and you sell out right away, that what a great press release. You know, sold yeah. sold 20,000 units in a day. Make sure you take a screenshot of it. Um, it. It's, you know, it's really, you can, you can spin anything, I guess, into something that is going to be uh, productive. The other mistake I probably made was not outsourcing uh, some of the busy work early enough. Mm -hmm. um, I was very proprietary and felt that I needed to do everything uh, myself, even though I had two VAs that have been with me since uh, 2010 that are really reliable. I was like, oh, I don't want to let them into my seller account, but they are, they are slowly taking up tasks for me. Uh, so that is freeing me up to be more strategic and less tactical. And that's great. So then just to clarify on the, on the VAs is the first thing that they've started helping out with is just mainly just customer service or are they doing something else as well? Uh, mainly customer service. I have their Filipino. So okay. I'm, I'm concerned about them interacting with customers, you know, from the, to be, because they're obviously not English speaking, but I have, uh, standard form letters that go out when, uh, you know, there's good seller feedback that needs to be converted to a product review, uh, when there's been a refund that happens. So they send out, uh, you know, form letter, you know, they fill out the information and, uh, and send those out for me. So I don't need to worry about that day-to-day -day maintenance. And it's just, if it's a big deal, it gets, gets escalated to me to help with. Awesome. Well, Susan, this was great. I think we'll, we'll need to wrap it up here for time, but uh, thank you so much for coming on. And yeah, I think there was plenty more we could talk about. So perhaps again, we'll invite you back on and thank you so much for sharing your expertise and some of these unique nuggets on this episode. Great. Okay. Well, it was great talking to you, Chris. All right, now is the episode with Susan. Hopefully you enjoyed that conversation. We covered some new items that we don't normally discuss on the show. And I think that they were helpful for you, especially if you're further along in the game and you're looking at further diversifying ways to either drive traffic to your listing or other types of strategies you can employ to grow your business. So thanks so much for tuning in. And if you enjoy the show, feel free to leave us a review. You can go to sellercast.com slash iTunes. Otherwise, we'll see you in the next episode.